Ah, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Off the Bench uh, Round Wrap for Round Four. I hope everybody had some uh, great scores and everybody, Captain Hines. Good luck to the around about five percent of you that did have uh, Hines and Captain him. Um, you're friggin' genius as well. You're not really geniuses. You probably had a lot of cash and you brought him in. Let's face it. But good luck to you as you've done well. I know we had one here that did. Good on you, Timmy. Good score there, mate. Uh, good score eventually, mate. It wasn't looking real good up to the start of that last game. I think I was sitting on, uh, was about 860 or something like that before kickoff. And I was absolutely shitting bricks uh, with Captain Hines left to play. And um, yeah, so I, I was looking about 150, 200 points below par, even at that stage. So um, yeah, so Hines came in, I think I'm sitting on about 1160 or something like that um, before um, updates. So all's well that ends well. I'd, I'm still not sure where that sits. I think that's probably about par. Uh, I'm currently leading five out of 10 of my leagues, but I think in two of them, I think I'm only behind by about 10 or 15 points or something. So so pretty close. Yeah, Cleary will probably get about 20 updates. Not Cleary, I mean, Hines. Uh, that's what I'm hoping yeah. for, mate. <laughs> he'll, end, he'll end up on 200. Well, I didn't see the game. I was texting you guys saying, what's he looking like for updates? And I, all I got was cricket. So you guys aren't helping me. Um, he's got four offloads to update. So he's going yeah. up. He'll go to he'll go to the 160s. Sensational. Wow. That's, um, yeah. yeah. For those people that had irons, as I said, congratulations. The rest of us on the panel here did not. How'd you go, Roscoe? Oh, not too bad. I've got eleven seventy three, which I thought was looking good until uh, that last game. Um, played Warwick, bench Pereira, um, captain Turbo. So I'm pretty happy with that, considering, to be honest with you. So um, I'll take that. Ah, very good. And last but not least, we've got Barnsley up the top there. How you going, mate? You've uh, how'd you go this week? Yeah, pretty good. Um, I I actually. Bit the bullet and got Hines in as well. I was huge on it this week as a move. Uh, I didn't captain him though, so Timmy went one better than me. But I am on eleven seventy two at the moment, um, and pretty happy with it. I would have obviously been happier if I got a better captain. So I captain Harry Grant for his forty four. That just seemed like the smart move. So um, and also seemed like the smart move to bench Warbrick in his current form, which I did, and I benched Khan Pereira, and you know obviously missed out on those scores. So. Uh, I guess it's the silver lining is that it could have been a fifteen hundred score if you play the right blokes and you captain Hines, but yeah, didn't quite do that. Um, but still happy. I reckon eleven seventy two is pretty good. I'd say, well, I think that below eleven fifty will be par. Um, seeing quite a few low scores still, um, and like we said, you know, a lot of low captains. Hines was really the only real outlier. Cleary was solid but not spectacular. I know, uh, but. but Barnes, if we're on your show for uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, mate, my um, my bench that I didn't play has probably got the best part of about 400 points on it, mate. So I think mm. I'll probably tick the good, the bad and the ugly all just in my NPRs. So like you said, uh, uh, you probably could have hit 1,500 if you you ticked all the right boxes. Yeah, mate, I've, I've, my squad of 25 uh, looks great, but uh, unfortunately I just didn't pick the right 17. But at, at least I've tipped the captain right and, yeah, is what it is. Yeah, it's hard at this point. I think it's if you got that on your bench in round three and four, as far as points potential, then you kind of know that your team's in a pretty good spot. When we were chatting before the show started, the boys were asking me how I was going and stuff, and I said that uh, I did. I started the worst I've ever started, and the first couple of weeks in particular were really painful. But even the first week, I didn't do a trade because I could still see my team look pretty decent. Um, so I think that's what you're looking for. Like if you if you play everyone that you're supposed to, and you throw up a thousand this week, then your team's probably in trouble. But you know, if you just took Hines off and you ended up benching some good point scorers, and your team's probably in decent shape still. Ah, very good. I got eleven twenty this week, but um, I don't have the luxury of having Hines, unfortunately, and I captained uh, uh, Harry Grant, so um, I did have a bit of fat in there that sort of helped boost me up um, a few good scorers. So a uh, bit like uh, Mark, I'm, I'm very happy with where I am, sort of with my team. Um, it's just a matter of, yeah, I, I think you've got to be in there for a bit of a long game this year. It's, um, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind betting that, uh, the, actually the overall winner probably is around about 20,000 right now in rankings. 
with some of those uh, top teams that uh, might struggle. We've, we've all had a bit of a look at some of them at the moment. Um, but anyway, let's get into the games. First of all, we've got the Eels versus Panthers. Um, and I'll start off this week because I, I definitely had a good look at this one. Um, Parramatta, yeah, they're, they're, they're funny scorers. They, they came out the winners, uh, but their super code scoring isn't through the roof and they really do spread the points around. Um, in their team, um, Hop God, well, he did what Hop God does. Um, <laughs> at least he didn't do the same as what he did last week. He got a 77 and sort of topped the topped the scoring there. Um, the big noticeable one is Maddo. He's back. And he did he play 80 minutes? I think he might have played yep. 80 minutes there he did. Um, yep. for a 74. So that nearly gets him around about a, a 0.095 PPM. So um, very, very good there. Uh, Mitch Moses, having become probably the highest NRL paid player come next year. Um, now that he's re-signed, uh, 53. Uh, hands coming in at hooker. Anybody like what they saw there? 50, 58 or something like that he got? He, he certainly looks, actually, he looks lively to me. I reckon he looks better than Hodge. Yeah, you know, I like what, no, go Mark, you're right. Well, I think a few people look better than Hodge. Um, <laughs> there's a, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think in the preseason, um, even the podcast that sort of said, oh, Joe is an all right go, still kind of had disclaimers. I don't think anyone was that wrapped in in Hodgson with his age and everything else. And I think that we've seen that. So wouldn't be surprising if... I don't think that because of his, um, his name value and his pedigree and his career that he's got, I don't think Arthur's got it in him to drop him. But it wouldn't surprise me to see Hodgson play 55 minutes. Uh, and that could be the way forward as well. And I think the pennant might be better off with that, to be honest. I think... Um, um, yep. I, sorry, no, I said I Penrith, know. I meant Parramatta. Yeah. <laughs> the wrong we, side. We know what you meant. <laughs> um, I think... Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually surprised that um, Hodgson played 80 minutes for those first couple of games. I didn't think it had him in him to play 80 minutes those games, but when Hands came on, he was just brilliant from dummy half, just so alive, so electric. Hodgson just seems to be a bit too slow out of dummy half for me, and he's got the experience. I, there's no doubt about that, but I can see a world where Hands might end up starting at some stage, and Hodgson comes off the bench potentially, plays a lot less minutes. Yeah, I, I can see him doing a similar role to to like what a lot of the other clubs are doing now. They 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 might put him on for the first twenty minutes or something, and then bring the the live wire hooker in for the the last twenty and the the first twenty of the second half to. And, uh, and run it through that way. He, he was certainly uh, much quicker in dummy half getting the ball out to the halves, and I think that's probably what Parramatta needed to uh, to re-kickstart their season. Um, for Penrith, Hoskin got 117. Uh, before everybody rushes to get him in, I would just say that possibly screams a little bit of a trap. Um, I, I don't have room really in my second row at the moment, but uh, he does have a, a super coach friendly game. Um, but I'm just not sure where he's going to get his minutes from if people start coming back. Edwards looked good as usual for his 82. Cleary, which a lot of us got, and I'm glad I held on to him. He lose a bit of cash this week, but I'm sure he'll bounce back. 77. Uh, to Arba, who a lot of us have got. 50, which I'll, I'll take that without a try. Um, I'm quite happy with him there. Uh, some of the scary prospects, Luke Garner for a 22. Um Geez, I'm glad I dodged that bullet. I did have him in my team for a little bit pre-season, but we got rid of him. Um, yes, uh, 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 Luke went off with a uh, a head knock, I think it was, wasn't it? Sonny Luke went off with yep. a head knock. Um, and he was the other real scary prospect. And of course, Mike... Sibbo too. And Sibbo and so I was about to say Sibbo well. on the other yeah. side. Uh, 19 for Sibs, but he, he's a bit rocks of diamonds like that. All right, let's... Tigers and Storm... Ah, who had a good look at this one? Barnsley, do you have you got some thoughts on this game? Um, look, the Tiger Storm, I definitely have some thoughts on it. I don't know how uh, good they're going to be to broadcast. <laughs> Harry Grant, 44. Um, lucky he updated to 44 because he was 38. And having a look at it, I was um, hard-pressed to find extra points for him to update. So it was almost a godsend that he got those six extra points. So he was the highlight for me because he was my captain and he was... I think ended up being the highest captain. I think he was just a shade above Taroyevich as well. So 
that hurt a lot of super coaches. So um, that was one, but probably the highlight was definitely Katoa. So Katoa for the Storm, uh, I in particular, was probably my favourite pre-season mid guy, especially in the Fords. Uh, I got him over Garner, and I almost second-guessed myself about it. And at this point, I think everybody that had Garner probably trading him to Katoa. So he showed it again. He ended up with 96 points. He just killed it. He's just getting line breaks every week now for the last few weeks in a row on that edge. And he's looking dangerous, and he's also just monstering people as well on the edge. So uh, I, I thought he's outstanding. Um, Warbrick got an 88. It's going to be really interesting because he was an 80 updated to 88, which was a nice update for him too. He looked good, but we've seen this from him before where he's looked good. But if the storm don't go to him, he doesn't get any clutch, which can happen. He's just going to be a nothing. So whether people run the gauntlet a bit more with him next week and actually pay off or get burnt by it, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Munster was a big return at 78 as well. I thought he looked pretty good. I thought he didn't look like he'd miss much time at all, which is solid for him. Um, but probably the only other couple ones I'll mention on the Storm side, I reckon, is Nick Meaney's um, the pod centre wing that I decided to have for the start of the year. And I've been really happy with him. He got 71 again on the weekend. And he heavily relied on clutch attack. Like he's got another try on the weekend. He's kicked the goals and that's where all his points have come from. Terrible work rate, right? but again, doesn't matter. And this is the thing in Supercoach that we're seeing in some of these games, particularly when it's quite a low-scoring year. It doesn't matter how you're going to get these points. If you've got guys that want to live on clutch attack, like the Hammer or Nick Meany, and they can keep doing it, then, you know, who cares? Nick Meany's kept doing it, so I, I love him at the moment, um, but I'm probably going to be selling him for the upcoming coming run. Uh, Pez at the last one on the Storm side, though. Interested in your boys' thoughts on him because he's kind of slipped through under the radar now where he's absolutely killed it. He's got 64 this week. He had a couple of line breaks and a tries the week before as well. And he's doing it with pretty low usage and he doesn't need much to be able to get these scores. So you've got a guy that's averaging, what he must be in the 70s at the moment or pretty close to it. Um, he's got a minus 36 BE going into next week at a, a bargain bottom price at 200K. Um, so obviously Hughes is going to miss next week, but he's going to get another opportunity next week to go up in a lot of a lot of cash. And then even if he ends up on the bench as a utility or something. So I, th I thought he's been pretty impressive for Supercoach as well. And no one's really talked about him. I think he's a bloody damn good option for a quick cash grab for next week. If you've got a gun like that you want to downgrade so you can get the cash to go up for Hines after the buy, he, that, that's your guy. He, he's your guy for sure. I think you could just bring, bring him in for next week. You know, you probably won't play out, play the week after that. You could hang on to him potentially, but it's a bit of a waste of a spot half back. But I think it's a bit of a stepping stone to getting an extra, a bit of extra cash to getting behind after his buy. I think that the only issue that I've got, like I, I, I think he's he's great and he certainly looked really good for the eye test on the field. But he's half back only, and like in my situation, I've got Cleary and now Hines, so like I've I've got nowhere to put him. So it, it's definitely a good idea if you were going like a maybe like a, a Katoa or something like that up to him who can you can sort of move between five eight and, and half back. So if you could drop Katoa maybe to um, uh, to Peasant, then that's probably not a bad thing. Or if you've got another a cheaper halfback in there, or sell a sell a five eight to bring a halfback in, or something. I don't know. Like it's it's um. I just think that in a lot of cases now, I think people are going to be falling over themselves to probably try and bring Hines in next week, even though he's only really going to be a one week play before he's got the buy. Yeah, I think that the moves with Pezet are going to be your five eight spot if you've got a Katoa there. Like, don't give up on Katoa. Move Katoa into six and sacrifice one of your your current sixes. And that can happen. Um, the other one that we've spoken about before we started recording as well is the fact that people have Schuster at six, which I think is just a bottom, but we'll, uh, can't even say it. It's just terrible. Uh, I'd be moving Schuster to, to the yeah, bench second row forwards to free up that spot as well. So I think with the um, the jewels at the moment, you've got a fair bit of ways to get Pezzard in unless you do own, own Hines and Cleary. But if you own Hines and Cleary, you shouldn't even worry about him anyway because you're just flying. Um, anybody on the Tigers? In, did you notice anyone from there very quickly? Any all the Bateman, obviously ninety five, but anybody else sort of um, stand out? I'll just come in and just defend Dewey for a minute because I think that he, um, I, I was keen to hold him, and I understand with injury and stuff, people want to jump off and everything. But like we saw it with Hines too, right? People didn't want to jump on Hines because he's hurt. But these, if these guys are playing, then they've been. 
they're not going to get risked the first few weeks of a season. Like if they're not if they're not healthy enough to play, they won't play. Um, certainly, Laurie on the bench was a bit of a worry initially when that you know looked like it might happen. But at the end of the day, though, they needed to be getting flogged if you know he was going to come off. I just I thought it was a bit of a knee jerk with Dewey. You know, he sort of he came in and he scored eighty nine points and fifty six points the first two weeks. You know, you can't be unhappy with that. He's got an average of seventy odd. And then the third week, he obviously bombed out and he was hurt. But they passed him fit for this week and he came through and he had 54 points in a game where, look, the Tigers looked better, but I didn't think that they looked very good still. And he did it in the ways that you love owning Dewey is how he scored his points. Like he had the um, a couple of, he had three offloads and multiple tackle breaks and 21 runs. Like and then he's goal kicking as well for a couple of goals that he pumped over. Like he's got fifty four points and he's done pretty much nothing out there, you know. So I'm just going to defend him a little bit, and I reckon that if he's doing that when the Tigers are going terrible and he's still averaging sixties at the moment with his, you know, round three score, it, it, you don't need to be rushing to trade this bloke out. I think he showed that on the weekend, even with just a fifty four. Yeah, look, that's that was that was how I got the Hines. Um, I ended up dropping Dewey, moved um, Katoa down and then brought Hines in that way. Um, look, I, I agree. I was fairly reluctant to sell him. I think I even said uh, on your show last week that I wasn't real keen to get rid of him. And then just I had to do something different after having two red arrows. And so that's why I brought in Hines straight away and, and went the captain straight on him. So that was that was always sort of part of my plan with that change. But, yeah, I, I was pretty keen to hold on to Dewey and if – things fell the way uh, that I needed them to with cash, um, I probably would have kept him there. Hmm. All right, Timmy, while you're up and going, you got any thoughts about your uh, your beloved Broncos? Where do you, how do you see this game, so mate? My, uh, my table-topping Broncos. Is that, that they're the ones <laughs> you're referring to, mate? Yeah, no, uh, the only team who's actually won four games. I'll, uh, I'll just put that out there. Yeah, mate, look, they've been fantastic. Um, uh, it was good to see um, Cobo get back to, to scoring some points this week. Um, most of the back line, like there was plenty of decent scores in this without anyone blowing the, the doors off. Uh, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven scores over 50. So any time a team scores more, more than seven over 50, you've got to be pretty happy with that. Look, a fairly low scoring game. Um, Reese Walsh, who is probably on my hit list this week to bring in um, at the expense of Luttrell, I reckon. Um, yeah, look, an 84, pretty impressive. Payne Haas updated to a 74, Cobo to a 73. Um, even Stags, Stags, Stags played all right at stages throughout the game. Um, yeah, was, was, was pretty happy with it. How's Jared Wallace, though? He's, uh, he's my sneaky pod that I bring in every year around origin time. Um, and he's, uh, he's one that I talked to Guy about last year and, and very happy that he got on as well. But yeah, Jared Wallace banging out an 89 free origin. You haven't seen that for a few years. Uh, the Hammer with a 60, Ewan Aiken, a little, he's been a little bit disappointing this year, Ewan Aiken. I, I'm not sure whether I'm not sure whether Wayne really knows how to use him yet or, or what his role is exactly in that team, but he's, uh, he's punching away, got a 58. Um, yeah, nothing massively overly excited me from the Dolphins, but, but pretty happy with the result, all the same for the Bronx. I'll tell you someone who was a little bit exciting for the Dolphins for me, and he's a bit of an under the radar one too, is Lemueli. He's on that on that edge now. And you know, it it, it looks like that he's probably going to stay there. Um, so he's one that to look out for because he's just gone 58 points, and that's after he's just gone. Sorry, he's gone 64 points. Um, it's he's got that eight in his rolling average from round two. But that's because he was coming off the bench and only scored 19, um, 19 minutes. First game, he played 50 minutes, got a try and a line break and scored 76. If he's locked into that edge role uh, and looks like that he is, all of a sudden at that sort of 350K mark, um, you know, his, his break even is going to come right down because he's got that, that eight in there from round two. Once that eight rolls out, everybody should be having a look at him because it's one of those ones that's going to go under the radar and you're going to look at him this week and some casual fans will look at it and go, he scored a 58, he's got a starting job. That was a good performance from him on the weekend, really solid. And then they're going to see his break evens in the 30s and go, oh, well, we're past it, he's 350K. They'll never notice in a couple of weeks' time he's going to have a negative break even probably and be scoring 60s a lot of the time. So uh, I'm definitely watching him and I thought that he was pretty solid again on the weekend. 
Um, don't forget Mark too. Come two weeks, he'll have dual position too, because he'll be second row seen the wing too, because he's he's only seen a wing at the moment. I mentioned him on the pod last week. Mm-hmm. Actually, he's a bit of a sneaky mid option too, and I know Brad's had a bit of say to him about the article. So yeah, I, I'm I'm liking what I see from him so far. He's really strong. A few line breaks. He looks he looks good. That, that duel will be a big deal. It'll mm. be massive for him. Massive. And also, I think people are co- co- confusing Kafusi banging out with him starting because it's a different edge, so it's not yep. going to matter. Yep. Oh, very good. All right, Roscoe, the, to- the Titans and Cowboys. Did you catch this one? I did. I did watch this game. Um, obviously, for the Titans, a uh, massive loss for them early in the game, losing uh, both um, AJ Brimson and uh, also... Here in four and two, um, Cowboys were far from convincing in this game as far as I was concerned. Um, you know, Pereira, obviously, with the goods, 117. Dave Fafita was in beast mode with a 96. Uh, Plotta Waker was really, really solid too with a 72 in about 49 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, Tino, 72, and Nani, 70. Um, there's a few disappointing scores there. Obviously, Grim, 12 with his um, injury. He's done hammy, apparently, so he's going to be missing a while. Um, Hess, 35. There's not much else there. Talani was a bit injured with 22, but um, there wasn't much there. Holmes was pretty solid with a 69, again. Um, there wasn't much else there, mate, to be honest with you. I didn't think Robson was a bit underwhelming with only scoring a 42. Yeah. Uh, what has anybody thought about the Nanai uh, two weeks now? Is, who's going to benefit there and did he deserve it? Anybody oh, see it? I think Luke, I think Lukey could benefit a lot. Um, yeah. And he's going to be someone that you should probably put on your waivers in draft. Uh, put your waivers on for Lukey because he's going to be good the next couple of weeks. He's always been good in limited minutes. Uh, he was a bit of a try scoring machine when he debuted. Yeah. And he could do it in in 25 minute stints. He could score tries. A um, little bit Nani ish in that way, but a different type of player. Um, so I, I really think that he'll go really well for a couple of weeks at 80 minutes. He'll also be a bit of a smoky too to have a look at because see what his break evens are like and stuff. And Hess has really not set the world on fire at all. So I'm not sure how much you know they're going to be set on certain edges. Um, so if he you get might get lucky with him in the next couple of weeks if he has that job if he gets that Nani job. Um, but I've Thought probably under the current conditions and stuff, and then I probably deserved it. It is only two weeks. It's not like a, a four-week suspension or something like Kafusi had to cop. So, yeah, it's, it, it probably seems about right to me. Hill and, Hill and Luke, yeah. break even current break-even for this round was 69. So he'll obviously uh, he'll actually go down a little bit in cash. So he's sitting at 451K at the moment. So he'll drop to 445, 440, something like that. Um, just to give you a bit of an update, the next two games for the Cowboys, they've got round five Bulldogs, then the Dolphins, the Warriors, Newcastle, Sharks and Roosters to round out their next six. So that's a pretty decent draw, I think, for the Cowboys. Mind you, we've been saying that for a few weeks now. And, um, yeah, the only Cowboy that I've got left in my team is Val. And I think every week I still question that one. So I think I sold him about three or four times this week and still brought him back in and, and kept it. So... Yeah, look, it's a, it's a decent draw for them if they can find a few more ways to score points. But I definitely like that Hill and Lukey one. He was actually the better of the two second rowers at the start of last season. Uh, he was outscoring Nanai every week and looked like an absolute bomb. And then he obviously uh, got injured. And and then uh, things had to move around and Nanai took over from there. I, I liked think- him more last preseason over Nanai. I had him in my side until he got dropped to the bench at last minute before round one and I had to reverse it out. I've, I think they've rated him really highly there and I, I think he's got a lot of talent. So it, it's going to be hard not to do it just in draft because in classic, it's the price point just might really hurt, but you'll need a role change more than a couple of weeks for it to probably be a classic move. I think um, the inclusion of drink water back next week will be should be hopefully uh, helpful for um, Holmes as well. So could also help his scoring, I hope. It's hard to say because it's like the Cowboys have come in and done nothing with the draw. Like, this is a game where you would have circled this one as your favourite one in the first month playing the Titans, and nobody scored above 70, and they still won. Mm. You know, it's they're just not scoring super coach points. They're not getting the clutch attack. And even when Drinkwater was there, it wasn't really particularly free-flowing. 
Um, Nanai at 70, you know, it's, he's done that having to get multiple clutch attack stats and he's barely gotten over to 70. Um, probably Valentine Holmes is the only one that's been matchup proof, which is surprising because one of the worries I had for him in this draw was that if they do go big and he doesn't get any of the clutch, then he's not going to be any good anyway. And that's why I gravitated towards a different option because of his ownership. But he showed in this one again, 69 points when there really wasn't many attacking points. He's actually doing really well, Valentine Holmes, considering the lack of attack that the Cowboys have got. No, oh, 100%. Good point. I'm actually going to be holding Holmes at the moment. And uh, uh, for much the same sort of uh, reasons that you spoke about with Dewey before, but... Um, uh, yeah, the points will come. You know, he's one of those ones you just got to hold him, I think, at the moment if you've done this far. All right, Manly versus the Rabbitohs. God, Manly were ripped off here. That's all I'll say. From a Manly tragic, yes, I know I've got the night shirt on, but from a Manly tragic, they're fair dinkum. This is just an absolute tragedy. Forward pass, no try. Cody Walker puts it on the dead ball line. Do you want me to keep going? There's other things that happened there. Just wrong. Anyway, what a it, disgusting... It was, it was a cracking game. Like, I still can't work out which pass was the forward pass, unless it was the very first pass in that particular set of six, which at the time I said, oh, that's forward. And then they kept playing and about five or six passes later, and then they brought it back. But uh, right. they didn't really confirm because the commentators couldn't work out which pass was actually forward. So It was the pass to, it was the, pass to the turbo that called forward, was it? It was about two minutes backwards. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, yeah. I mean, Schuster, Schuster threw two passes in the play, and and I don't think either of his were were forward. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was you, you just you leave watching, scratching your head at those ones. You just you can watch it over and over again and still can't no, can't work it out. Yet, I think, like I said, the one at the start of that play, I think was forward, and that's not the one that got called. So who fucking knows? No, nah, who does know? Um, disgusting game, super coach wise. Really, I'm oh, not disgusting. It's it's quite adequate. Uh, Cody Walker was actually the best with a 79. Mm. Jesus, what a worry this is if you actually own him, which not many do. But 79 with two tries. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow, how bad would it could it have been if he didn't have them? Like, it's, he mustn't, there's not much base there running around. Um, yeah. Colin Matani, you talk about base. He's just a, yeah. wow, anybody impressed with him? But, yeah. He's the best yeah. second row in the comp early on. The first yes. three weeks, there's nobody better than him. And that's that's in real life and also in Supercoach. In, in Supercoach, he's scoring 82 points a game, and that was before he's around 470. So he's still going to maintain around 73 or something average. And he scored tries in two out of his four games, which you can say is a lot. But at the end of the day, he's a try scorer. And I think last year they figured out how to unleash him with his try scoring. Um, and you're just seeing it pay dividends now. So he's... He's got a base in the 50s and he's an edge back rower like, and he can get clutch attack. He's um, If he wasn't 700,000, I would have started with him and every single game, including on the weekend that I watch, I've got the shits that I couldn't put him in my team. Yeah, I, I actually wish I went uh, when him over Murray. But anyway, Murray, uh, 59. Uh, owners this week are going to be considering, I'm certainly considering him selling him before he bleeds a bit more cash and maybe buy jewels going up to... Uh, you're getting Hines in. Um, probably the most worrying thing there for owners, uh, I sold him this week, so I'm pretty bloody happy, it was Thompson, Isaac Thompson. Um, just hasn't done what we all <laughs> thought he was going to do. What, you scratch People your head talking to into keeping him. <laughs> oh, get out of here. You should have listened to the All-Stars podcast, Timmy. Oh, you would have been all right, mate. Thanks. So, oh, <laughs> never near him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was all over selling him, and the boys said, "Oh, look, he's only one try away from like he'll just get that kick on." And and uh, yeah, I was I was pretty much outvoted even in my own team. <laughs> I kept him, played him, and yeah, just, no. I'll save you on um on the Isaac Thompson by saying I actually think the Latrell Mitchell's a big worry at the moment. Yes, and yes. I I wouldn't normally like I'm very big on. It is where it becomes like a like when you talk about someone like Cameron Murray, like I would say to people, yeah, like if you've got a really good option and you need cash, Cameron Murray's a good out at the moment because he's really different to selling gun backs. Like if you've got the gun fullbacks, the gun halves, it, it's it's a lot harder to sell them because they've got the massive scores in there that can hurt you. Whereas someone like Murray, you've got him for the 70s and 80s and the solid scores. And occasionally you can throw up a big one, but really like he's, he's not going to get too many 
you know, 120s and stuff. So he's not going to get any 150s. He's not really going to burn you that much. So you can let him go. And the gap between him and another front, the second row forward is not that big. So you're all right. Whereas, but Mitchell, I'm totally different with, like just watching the footy that he's playing. I know that he hasn't been that involved as a player normally, but he's just not, he's just not doing it enough. And unfortunately it seems like Cody Walker is having some renaissance a little bit, but not enough to be relevant. And Lachlan Ilias, credit to him, has improved, but it's not coming through in Supercoach, but he's getting a lot more usage. They're going right heaps more than what they used to. They used to smash the left, and Latrell prefers the left, and now they're going right a bit more. Um, and that's because I think Ilias has improved. So I don't think that's helping Latrell. And then you've got Latrell playing how he does, which is floating in and out a little bit, not really taking the game. I'm 34 on the weekend, and I didn't really love you know what I saw from him, so... I'd be a bit worried. I think Latrell's a worry out of this game because you invested a lot of money in him. Look, at, at half time, and this won't surprise you, at half time, I think he had three runs. For 40 minutes of football, three runs. And I'll let you think about the involvement of that. Yeah, that speaks volumes, really. I mean, Jacob Host, I think, had more runs than what he had. There you go. <laughs> um, and the worst part is for owners like myself, like his, his BE was 130 or something like that. So he's missed his BE by 100. So he's going to lose the best part of 100k this week. So he's um, he's a definite out for me at this stage because obviously this low score is going to sit in his round, for, uh, his rolling average for another couple of rounds, and I think he's just going to absolutely bleed cash. You might pick him up in a couple of weeks for 550 or, or 550 600 something like that. Well, we've spoken about South's hard draw too, but like, yeah. I mean, they're actually winning and playing well at the moment, so that's a worry. Like, if they're winning and playing pretty well, and he's at scoring a 34. And then it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a concern because, yeah, when they have those tough games and they will have them and they aren't winning those ones, um, the trail could really, really hurt you. But, yeah, you know, we've seen him go on runs before, so, I mean, it might be a bit premature. I'm not ready to write him off completely. The ne- next six games are Melbourne, Bulldogs, Dolphins, Panthers, Broncos, Melbourne. Mm. So there's certainly some tough games in there. Um, okay, for Manly, uh, Okaladu does what Okaladu does, just steadily there. Uh, Ruben Garrick, or owners will be reasonably happy that he... I, sometimes I never even know where he gets his points from. You just they're scratching your head at the end of the game, but 71, good on him, did well. To Alagi, he's just increasing slowly in, in cash, which is what people would have got him for. Um, uh, the uh, two biggie worries, I guess, you know, Tommy T, 48. Well, that one try that got disallowed and et cetera, there's line breaks. There's all sorts of things going on there that points that he would have got. But anyway, um, bad luck if you did captain him. And probably the big talking point there is Josh Schuster uh, with the score in the 20s. What did he get? 26. Um, points and I know there was quite a few people that were forced to actually play him this weekend. Um, yeah, Timmy, yeah, I'm the same. I'm not forced to, I chose to. Like, if, if you're yeah. bringing him in, you had to play him as simple as that. It's no, it was no point really bringing him in and then not playing him with the, the upside that he does have and the involvement that he got in, in last week's game. Uh, I think if you're bringing him in, you had to play him. The just the the try that got disallowed that we talked about before. I mean, for me personally, that probably lost me 40, 45 points or something between Turbo and Schuster being so heavily involved in that particular play. But yeah, look, at least he was trying to get involved. It wasn't coming off for him. Um, but all I'll be doing this week is I'll uh, I'll probably send, sell Trent Liero and move him up into second row so that then I can uh, can look at bringing Dillbags in. So I'll be, con- I'll be Sorry, controversial and say that I probably won't play him for the whole year. Schuster. I was going to say, I was going to say, I traded him in, and I was never playing him this week against Souths. There was always going to be a low-scoring, hard battle game, um, and yeah, I was just purely bringing him in for a downgrade because I went, I traded an AJ Brimson, thank goodness to him, just to bring some cash to get Hines in uh, for next week. But yeah, I was never playing him. It's it's hard because I understand where Tim's coming from, mm. um, and like, but I think. You know, when I say I might not play him for the whole year that I own him, like I'm looking at him like a Khan Pereira, except he's got less upside at the moment. Like Khan Pereira, you, you're probably not going to play those guys. You look at them as cows that are going to be on your bench. And I looked at Schuster like that this week. And actually, like, I'm not sure where his break even is going to end up, but going 59 and 26, 241,000, you're not going to have a massive break even. Um, it's going to be decent. So yeah, you probably get him for a cash grab, but. 
I'm not interested in playing him at all at the moment until I see a bit more from him. Like I take Timmy's point. He's, he's definitely got some talent, but he's had a nine, nine raw base last week. And we saw him run the ball seven times this week and have two penalties as well. He's got the errors in him and he's got the low work rate. If the clutch attack doesn't come off, then, you know, it's going to be an issue. But then you've got to match up with someone like Newcastle and they're playing them at Manly. So, you know, that's when it becomes a bit tempting to have him as your last reserve. But I think most of the time at the moment, it's, it's going to be pretty dicey. Well, break even was minus nine. Um, but as you said last week, you got a 59 with three tries. That's a bit of a concern. Hmm. See, the other, the other reason, obviously, that I had to play him this week was because I sold Dewey. So that was yep. always part of the plan that I, I didn't have too many other options. Um, but my plan was always bring him down to 5'8 just for this week and then move him up to second row next week. You can't complain about plans at 149 points, mate. So uh, no, no excuses needed. Don't worry about that. <laughs> exactly right, mate. Exactly right. Uh, all right. The Warriors versus uh, the Bulldogs. Barnes, did you catch this one? I did, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> wasn't It wasn't a great game. Um, I think... But we'll start on the Warriors side. Sean Johnson, I think, was a bit of a highlight. He was the second highest scorer for them. Varley got 95, but Johnson's probably the talking point. 84 points, um, some good line break assists, and then he got a line break try. Um, what I will say, and, you know, you, you can't really say it, but I will. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it wasn't an obstruction when he scored that try. He had a front rower, the biggest front rower on the field, standing next to him like a blocker in the NFL that basically pushed Reed Marnie out of the way so he could go under the sticks and they just let it go. I don't understand it. I I, um, I couldn't hear the commentary well enough on that play to be able to see the explanation. But, you know, you take that off and he's he's in the 50s again with with goal kicking and a, a couple of line break assists and some big clutch in there. So, yeah, but he still went pretty well. And, you know, credit to him, I didn't expect him to be scoring... 58.3 coming into this round and then he's thrown up that 84. So he's actually interesting again, at least. Um, but other than that, I think Jackson Ford returning on a 55 was solid. I keep waiting for Fanil Blake not to get the clutch attack stats, boys, but he got another line break today again. So he went up to 60. He's been pretty solid. He's had clutch attack for three out of his four games, I think. Um, but the rest was you know, pretty largely forgettable. I thought on the Bulldog side, uh, Karaz was the shining light for the whole game. Karaz has gone 78 points. Um, obviously, he was reasonably popular a couple of weeks ago as a trade. He's now gone up to 20%, which I didn't see coming. I think a lot actually jumped on this week as well um, because he was sort of hovering around. When he got popular, it still looked like projecting to sort of 12 or 13% a week ago, something like that. And, and just all of a sudden, the, the floods came in. But he looks like he's really going to be worth it. Um, he had the try again today but I think again you're looking at those offloads and half a dozen tackle breaks and that's why you get him in and he did it again to the Warriors today um, despite there not being many points. Um, probably the other notable Bulldogs thing for me in this one we had um, Burton kicking again he only scored a 45 and that was a 45 without the clutch attack stats um, that he's going to need but uh, I think he had one assist in there but he did it with uh, goal kicking again and he didn't have the goal kicking last week. So it suggests that he's going to hold on to the goal kicking at least. So if people have to hold him, at least you've got that. Um, but really like pretty largely disappointing super coach game, really. You only had for the Bulldogs, one person that got in the 60 plus range. Um, and then for the Warriors, you had four, but two of them are Valia and Montoya who are, don't really think that you can go near. But having said that, you know, Montoya is one of those ones that keeps popping up in the top, 10 scorers for each each week at the moment. So maybe he's a bit of a smoky and we're just not giving him credit. I'm not sure, boys. Yeah, Preston was a bit underwhelming with a 42 as well, I thought. He didn't, um, didn't, mm-hmm. didn't seem to be getting very involved. I mean, obviously, it was a low-scoring game. Um, what was the other one? Um, I was going to mention, uh, CNK was pretty solid with a 47, but he was on like 18 points at half time, which wasn't great. Um, yeah, there's not much else there, Martin. He's been a bit underwhelming the last two weeks as well with a 51 and a 40, 41 or something as well. So, um, yeah, it's been a bit disappointing. But, yeah, that's pretty much it really for that game for me. The one that I forgot to mention too is Kikau. Um, I was looking at him. That. Yeah, because he, he's on 625K as a price point, but he's just dropped the best part of 62,000. 
So it's always interesting when you get these guys that can go on good runs. And he looked, I thought he looked looked a lot better last week. Didn't look quite as good this week. He had a real low work rate. Wasn't getting the ball, wasn't running it. Um, but you're looking at these guys because you know, he's going to have a massive break even. And he could very well go down to 500K across the next fortnight. And then all of a sudden you start to get those juicy prices. And I think that you saw inklings of him, you know, maybe getting used to things. Um, so yeah, I think he might get interesting soon, but at the moment he's obviously very disappointing, but that could present opportunity for super coaches down the track. All right. Now the last game of the round, uh, Roscoe, are you on the Marzu train? We've got two more. We've got two more to go. What have I missed? We've got Newcastle, Canberra, and then we've got... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, all right. The Newcastle game. The um, Yeah, you on the Marzu train at all? Jeez. I mean, I don't I don't have any... I don't... I've got other, other trades I'm probably looking at doing for next week, but... Um, and obviously, home, Holmes is an you know, option to downgrade to Marzu, but I'm going to hang on to Holmes, so... I did pick up Marzu in some drafts, which was handy. He was just sitting there in some drafts. So I jumped on him in about three or four drafts, and he actually saved me in a couple of drafts, which was good. Um, yeah, he's definitely going to be an option to look at at some stage, but how I get there, I don't know. That's the thing without selling homes. Uh, what else did you like in this game? Well, okay, guy was. Gagai was just in, in beast mode. He got 100. Uh, Lachlan Miller solid again with an 87. Um, he goal kicked as well, which is not- notable. Yeah, geez. And it's been people jumped on him off him this week too, I know. So um, Hudson Young um, played the full 80, got an 82. So he looked okay as well. Um, but again, perhaps trust the Ricky Roulette with the forwards, with the rotations. Um, and Frizzell with a 78. Um, obviously, there was a few few not so good ones there. You know, Hastings, 37. But other than that, look, there wasn't really much to talk about super coach wise from that game, really. Tarpany was pretty good with a 66 for those who have got him. Um, Brab and Best might be one to keep an eye on with a 68. He's, he's um, been pretty solid to start with, but probably a bit expensive for my liking. Just a question for you, boys. I, I missed the Karaz train and, uh, and now Lockie Miller as well seems to be fairly consistently scoring. If uh, I wouldn't be looking at a downgrading a Val, but I, I'm going to have some cash left over after I bring in Dylan Dylan Brown this week. But I'd like to do something like um, dump Thompson and and get in one of these uh, like a second uh, more premium centre wing. So Lockie Miller had a, a BE of about thirty five, so he's probably going to go up another thirty or forty k. So it gets him somewhere around about six fifty. Is is he worth targeting now with a Latrell downgrade or? Um, and bring him in at fullback, or would you still take Walsh uh, and play him at fullback, or um, yeah, or do, or do I look at bringing in someone and um, going into the centre wing? Well, I think what, uh, he's, he's been. Oh, sorry, mate, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, my personal thought would be, no, you're crazy to to go away from Walsh. I, I think there's a reason you're looking at Walsh, and um, yes, it is very. Not very base reliant. He has a lot of uh, it's a, it's a, to use Barnes's word. There's a lot of clutch attack there that that uh, really benefits uh, Walsh. But um, you want a high ceiling bloke. He's the one you want. Yeah. I I, I kind of like Lockie Miller um, because he's shown. I think there was still question marks on his base and his base attack. What level he's going to be able to consistently do it. Uh, coming into this week, he's hitting above 50 points in base base attack. So his tackle breaks obviously are a big key to that, but his actual running and stuff, his raw base is 28, which is you know better than what I thought it would be. You know, you get guys like Latrell that are sort of 22 or something. Um, so it's, I think when you throw in the goal kicking, like if he's going to keep goal kicking, all of a sudden you look at it and go, well, he has to score 50s or 60s each week. He's not going to get lower. And his first two weeks he went 52 and 50. Um, and then obviously with the 98 and then a, a big one again today, pretty similar. So well, I like him. And then the problem is that you look at the price tag, Tim, and then go 650000 and it's also the Knights. And I think those are the big drawbacks. It's it's expensive. And I don't know how often the Knights are going to play like they did today against Canberra. They go away against Manly, a good home game against the Warriors. And then they've got Penrith at home. Cowboys away, Parramatta at Combank, and then a bye. 
So I just, I think, I think the buy and the fact that it's Newcastle probably means my interest is gone, but it, it could be the the pod that, that really works for you because a lot of people will stay off probably. Yeah, that was the hard part. That's the reason why I didn't start with him um, was just the fact that he's playing for Newcastle and they were just looking shit. Like it's the all signs even from the, the preseason wasn't looking real flash. So it's, um, yeah, just an interesting one. If you've missed him and you've missed Karaz, whether you sort of toss a coin and take one or the other or, or what, I'm not quite sure. I think Karaz is going to be, um, would be my pick. Uh, I think that he's got Brian Tai season written all over him when Tai broke out. Hmm. Yep. All right, the lucky last game. Now we're at the last game. Uh, Dragons versus the Sharks. The Nico show was on uh, display here. This is all pre-updates. We're going to be talking, people. So uh, just bear with us. 149, it looks like, that Hines has sort of uh, ended on. Um, Nakora, 96 as well. Have a look at some of these scores. Ramian, 94. Uh, that's not bad for a bloke that won't pass the ball. Uh, Mulatalo, 85. Uh, Teague Wilton for Teague Wilton owners, um, 69. You know, so there's some damn fat scores all the way through there. Even Katoa manages to get over. Um, unfortunately for the Dragons, it all looks pretty bleak and sad. Um, I really don't know what to, you know, if you've got Zach Lomax, sorry, 16 points. Uh, Jack Bird, I know some people are getting on him because of his dual status, and you know, like uh, that second rower in the in the uh, in the centre position. Well, he only got to be a twenty nine. Um, so it really was all about the Sharks, and if you have a look at the scoring, <laughs> all the big scores are on the Sharks side. Actually, believe it or not, at the thirty minute mark it was twelve points to eight. Um, so it was a very very quick demolition. It's sort of like someone flicked the switch and bang. Um, as I was watching it, it just, yeah, it was unbelievable. It just went boom, 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 and just kept on happening. Um, it's one of those games where everything Hines touched, even even when he made an error. I don't know if you did you see the try off the error? The he kick. actually, yeah, yeah, the kick. He made yeah. a friggin' error and he turned the error into a try and a try assist. Like, it, he got, what what the hell? Like, well, Brayden Ham and Ueli balls up a, tr- a certain try as well. He yeah. dropped the ball over the line, and that would have been a line break try assist too that Nico would have got, and also the goal kick under the sticks. So he, <laughs> he could, and Nico Hines spent the last six minutes on the sideline. He he would have been, he could have easily ended up on two hundred points today. That's what was so scary. I think people. Um, so the, I guess the bit, biggest question, and and we're towards the end of our show, here we was love this discussion. How do we get him? Who who's getting him in? Uh, I guess two of you have him already. So Roscoe, what are you planning, mate? Well, I'm getting him in. I've got 576 k in the bank, and after what I saw today, there's no way that I'm not having him on team for next week against the Warriors. Um, you know, I'll have Cleary as my backup halfback, so he'll just sit on the bench for a week. I can't go through that again. I just can't. <laughs> but I'm just actually glad that. Pretty much, I still won nine out of ten leagues, and I think I lost one by two points. Three updates, um, and he's just got to get. I've just got to get him in. I'm just glad that most of my opponents. No, I don't think anyone had him. So, and if they did, they were that far behind that his hundred and forty nine didn't help them. So, um, I yeah, think I'll the start. big the yeah. big takeaways from this one is that Nico makes all the sharks relevant again, and that's what like I was sort of waiting for. I was saying a couple of weeks ago. I'm eyeing off guys like Mulatalo, especially um, to a lesser extent, Katawa, um, and even Ramian becomes more relevant because they all had massive break evens and they weren't scoring well and they were going to drop bulk cash, which they all did. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Nico comes back and they're all scoring 80s and 90s and they did it easily. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's the other Nico effect. You know, if you've already got Nico Hines, well done. Have a look at how else he can benefit through Nico being back at the Sharks. And that's having a look at some of these other options as well for, for any upcoming runs because you might get some of them like Militalo cheaper than what they will be the next month. I think the big ones to benefit out of Nico back is also Wilton and also the other Nicora. I think both of them are going to massively benefit. Like I think Nicora scored nine tries last year and I think pretty much all of them were off Hines passes. Um, so I think both of them are 
definite watches for the next few weeks. But I'm with you, um, Mark, on Mulatalo on that too, because, you know, the more they drop in price, you know, they've got a juicy draw coming up. You, you, have, you want to be all over them. Yeah, and it makes it hard. Like, this is why I was big on getting them now. I'm getting it. Um, because it makes it really hard because, you know, you two boys that don't have him, you know, I know Roscoe's already said he's going to grab grab him, but, I mean, you're going to get him and he, you're going to have a good good matchup against the Warriors where he scored 190-odd points last year against them, but you're also then going to have a buy. So it's a real big one to make, and I sort of I said to a couple of people today that didn't have him, yeah, I think I can see if you're going to rip your team apart and it's really hard for you to get there, then there is some benefit to pause and say he's not going to change in price um, despite the big score because he's got one game and then the buy. So you've essentially got another two weeks of football before you then have to look at him that third week of football coming up. And that does give you some time to move some money around, to get some plans together, to do some other things. And you've only got to sit through one game in the next fortnight of <laughs> going maybe 150. So, I mean, there is some cause to maybe say that that could work for you. Uh, but this is why it's hard, right? This is why it was, I think, better this week because you got two quality games out of it and you didn't have to make that sort of decision. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if I didn't have that 560k or whatever it is in the bank, I wouldn't be able to cut apart my team to get him in. I'm wasting a boost to get him in for next week, but because I've got the cash there, that's the only reason why I'm doing it. History says it was always a good play. His two biggest scores that he's uh, his biggest scores in Supercoach were um, against his opponents this week and next week. So, like the next six rounds, he's got the Warriors, then obviously the bye. He's got the Roosters, Bulldogs, Cowboys, and then Dolphins. So, um, I think he can do can continue to do pretty well. Let's wait and see which Roosters team turns up. They seem to be um, certainly not firing on all cylinders at the moment, but they did get the job done the other night. So, yeah, let's wait and see. The um, the Mulatalo point you made, it's really interesting, actually, because, uh, I mean, I hadn't given it much thought, but having a quick look at him, I mean, he's got a, a 49 break even. So that means that obviously he's going to go up in price. He's already near 600. Um and Qatar is at 560, and he's got a break even as well. It's uh, uh, what's oh well, no, he had 125 break even, so he's going to come down. So, Qatar might be one that's going to be interesting. So, it, I love the that back line, it's a very it's got to be the most expensive back line in, in super coach, <laughs> but um, yeah, you're just going to have to look at the figures and try to figure out, I think, if you're looking at it and try to pick which one is on the at yeah, the right time to pick them, you know what I mean? Because, you know, once more the like gets well over 600, which he will be this week, starts getting very expensive pick, doesn't it? Yeah. And the scary thing is as well, that if you do hold off for too long, uh, you will potentially pay a million dollars when you go Heinz later on. Um, and that's going to be even harder than 900 grand. So you could argue at the moment, he's actually going to be valued to get in because he's got 149 in his rolling average at the moment. He's priced on just under an 86, which was the best in the game anyway at 900K. Um, he could easily be averaging 110 points because of that 150. And he can do that with two really average next couple of games. So he's already going to be going up in value. Just how much depends on how much he puts on the Warriors. If he puts 100 on the Warriors next week, which some people will be relieved about because it's not 150. But if he puts 100 on them, that's an average 125 points he's going to have on his season going into a week that he's then going to change in price with a break even. So it's um, it's a scary prospect to think that you can wait a few weeks more and then be paying a million dollars for him and then also have the origin time looming as well. So it's a bit awkward. Bungie, just out of interest, yep. what, what do you think is going to happen with him come origin? Obviously, if everyone's fit and firing, where's he going to fit? I think he's in the team. I just I think that he is... If I was picking the team, um, he would be in the halves. Uh, and Lou, I would be nowhere near the team. Um, I'd have, um, if one of the, if either Latrell or Trebojevic is out, I'd have, you know, um, Burton at centre like he was last year. Um, and that's sort of how I'd do it. And even if, you know, you've got Burton and him fighting Lou I for that half spot at six, I'd put Hines there easily. But he's, the reason why I was so surprised last year is because he's such a good utility. 
He's played every single position in the entire back line and he's done it for good teams in big games. He's played major semifinals in the centres for Melbourne. He's played at fullback. He's played at 5'8". He's played at halfback winning a Dally M. And he's played on the wing before. Like, now yeah, that's not a utility value guy who's coming off a Dally M winning season, who steered his team to second. As the, And when he's out of the team, they're not even a top eight side. Like, I just can't see him not being in the origin team. Um, it, it, I think even if they did him really, really dirty, he'd still be 18th man. And whether they actually get released or not this year, we have to wait and see what the rules are on that. So I, I just think that he's he's got to be in there. Um, and I mean, you saw it today. Like I, I tweeted a couple of different things, but like, I don't know what, I still think that people are underselling him. Like when you were looking at, you know, whether they're getting this week or not, I understand people not doing it, but some of the arguments and things, it was like, do you, does everyone remember that this is the guy that was the best player in Supercoach last year? Like he's number one. There was no one better. He scored 86 points a game. He's the best player. He also in real life won the Dally M. So it's not even like it's a fluke or it's just some stat padding. Like he was the best player in the game as well with the Dally M. Like, and he's at an age where he's just going to get better. And my argument to people that say, well, it's one year is that, yeah, but it's his first year that he ever played in the halves in a team that was far less capable than what the storm is that he had to lead around the park under extenuating circumstances. And he did it at his age and won a Dally M his first year. But what do you think the second year is going to look like after he's got that under his belt? Well, I just think it's a no brainer at the moment for him in every way, shape or form. I agree, mate. Absolutely. The, the wife shouldn't even be near that team this year. Cleary and Hines should be the Hines. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's what will end up happening too with how Luai has been playing so far. I think he's playing his way out of it. No, no, well said. Uh, but we, who, who is to know who get, gets to play Origin? I mean, Adokar didn't get anywhere near it, did he? And then he goes and plays for Australia and kills it. So um, who can figure it out? All right, Timmy, what sort of trades are you looking at this week? Uh, yeah, look, I've, mine's pretty easy. Um, I'll uh, dump Trent Liero. I think he's been pretty underwhelming. Uh, I'll move Schuster up into second row and bring in Dylan Brown. Um, they've got ideally I'd wait a week I think from round six onwards for the Eels I think is better but um, yeah I, depending on what his BE he ends up being after a slightly below pass score for Dillbags this week um, but take this week out of it he's been playing really well so but he, he's just he's passed the eye test as well he's, he's had his hands on the ball a lot and creating a lot so I think it's um, on my on my uh, notorious whiteboard that sits in my study here, um, I've had him circled for a while for round six, but I think uh, I've got the cash. I've got 350-odd K sitting in the bank, and I think he'll come in this week. And then I think it'll be a Latrell downgrade to Walsh or um, or bring in a decent centre wing, a second decent centre wing. It's uh, just going to be a bit of a lottery as to who that becomes. No, very good. I like the Walsh one for what it, what it matters. I, I think that's... Uh... That's a nice one. Roscoe, where are you at looking at? Well, I was going to trade out Katawa to Hines, but I think now that um, Sean O'Sullivan's out, it looks like Katawa's most likely going to hold his spot. I know he hasn't been scoring great, but I still think he's got got cash to be made. So I'll probably move Schuster up to the second row. And I'm not sure, to be honest with you, who I'm going to trade out to get him in. I might have to potentially move off from Mowali or something and shift them up to the front row. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'm really not sure with that position yet. Um, yeah, and the other trade, I'm not... The other trade, I don't know if I'm going to do a second one yet. I don't think I need to. I'm pretty happy with my team. Um, so I may not make a second trade. Yeah, nice. Barnsley, what are you looking at? Um, n- not too sure. But uh, there's a few that I'm sort of earmarking. One of them is to get a, a front rower in. Um, I'm filthy that I didn't start with Hass like I was going to. Uh, Joe Tuppany, for those that have been watching, 580,000 at the moment, um, had 100 plus BE and just threw up a 60 something. So he's going to be 550 odd, something like that, maybe a bit below. So he might fix up my front row forward problem at a cheaper price than Payton Hass. So he's a possibility. The other one is, well, I've sort of earmarked. Um, the center wing roulette game with my guns. And I, I think I've used up Nick Meany as much as I can at the moment. Um, so he's potential out. 
Um, I really like him, but their storm their storm run is going to be a bit harder, and they've got a buyer coming up. Uh, so Ruben Garrick playing Newcastle this week. Um, I'm keen to have a lot of pieces of that game at Brookvale, and I will call it Brookvale still, not Four Pines, but <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I'm looking at those couple, um, and probably the only other one. Yeah, probably those ones. Um, I think front row forward and um, and and just that centre wing spot. Um, I mean, I did. I traded out um, against everything that I wanted to do. I, I traded out James Tedesco um, because I had to get Hines this week because I was falling too far behind and I needed a game changer. So I did that, uh, and I sort of, and even though I got the the money from Hines, I'm regretting it still. So I'm even going to look at you know. Do I need to get Teddy in again this week? Do I need to just say I shouldn't have done it, even though I've got the points? But I probably won't. I'll, I'll put that for a couple of weeks' time like I planned on and get Teddy back in then. Oh, See, that's, a, that's a really interesting question, Barnsley. Um, I did toy with that as well, with going Trell down to Teddy. Um, I think it's it's not such a bad play. I'm, I've already started writing my um, my Fear Factor article this week and, and uh, looking at a bit of a rooster booster. So, yeah, with those guys coming off the buy, it's um, it's going to be interesting. So It was really hard for me to trade him. Um, and, I, look, I only did it, I said on, on the All-Stars podcast this week, I'm going back on what I wanted to do, but it's because I'm taking a high-risk play that I don't think is a smart play. But sometimes they're going to come off and you've got to do it if you're really chasing points, which I was. And it came off for me for this week. And I'll deal with next week when I get to next week. And my dealing with it could be that I just nullify that and get him back in. And it's just a one-week rental because we've got that many trades. And the one of the reasons I didn't want to trade Teddy was because he's got a really good record against Parramatta. And Parramatta have been giving up points. They've been playing better, but they've been giving up points. And it's at Allianz, I'm pretty sure, as well. They've yeah. got the week off with the buy and they were a bit battered. Guys like, you know, some of those guys needed a week off for the Roosters. They're already struggling with numbers, with injuries and stuff. And Teddy, you, you can back and death ride him into the ground as much as you want, but he's not going to keep scoring 50s and 60s. He's going to get a big score. And I've said it for a few weeks now. You know, it's every time he's get, giving you another 55, you better be scared about not having him that following week. So, you know, he's, can he go four in a row going 50s or low 60s? Like, it's, it's hard. He doesn't normally. So I'm pretty worried. <laughs> What's your guys' thoughts on go, um, Christian Welsh trading him to Tarpany? I think it's a bit sideways. I, I'd do it like a million times. And if I died, I'd do it in my next life a million times again. <laughs> like, <laughs> I absolutely agree. I, I was going to ask Barnsley the same question before when he was talking about tapping, Um, because I'm in the same boat. I've got Christian Welsh there and um, he's, he's just not getting the consistent minutes at the moment that he we all sort of expected. Belly aches if you're playing around with his forward pack, a, a bit like bloody Ricky Stewart does. Yeah, but you, you only ever got Welsh in the beginning as a cash grab. I mean, uh, Tarpany's in a different class. Uh, point, you have a look at their points per minute. They're, they're worlds apart. Um, yeah, Welsh is not a Tarpany. Um, I know yeah, Tarpany, I, Tarpany's I only still, getting 48 minutes, but he's a much better prospect than Welsh. Absolutely. But, like, I've got Christian Welsh thinking he'd be scoring 65 to 70. Um, and that was sort of what... It was a cash cow, but I kind of figured it was a good chance he could turn out to be a bit of a keeper as well with the uh, the forward pack, that the storm of lost, the forward stocks, I should say, that they've lost. I figured Welsh was going to be playing 65 minutes plus, at which point scoring a point a minute and going 65 to 70 if he gets any manages to get any attacking stats. The only thing I would say with Welsh, because I, I, I can't wait to get rid of him. Um, I can't believe it's the third year that he sucked me in, but... Um, he's made like he's basically stayed the same price. He's like two thousand dollars up on his starting price, but he does have that twenty eight that's going to roll out pretty soon. So he he will make some more money still, and you would hope that maybe you get lucky and he's going to be pretty solid in the fifties still. Stefano Uta Kamano has been disappointing, and he's gone through another average score on the weekend in the forties. Um, had a minus twelve break even going into this weekend's game, and has already gone up the best part of sixty thousand. So he's going to have given you oh, maybe 85000 once lockout happens. And he's also going to have a break even. There's nowhere near negatives. So he becomes probably more of a proposition where you might have to pay 120000 But 120000 from Stefano to Tapani, that's that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, good trade. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. 
All right, our time, we're just about going to be wrapping this one up. Barnsey, can you, uh, many thanks for coming on tonight. and really wrapped to have you, actually. It's been really uh, interesting. Um, you want to let the listeners know where they can find you and uh, your other pod that you're on? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so you can catch us on the NRL All-Stars podcast. We've got two episodes a week. So uh, certainly we've got a super coach love that we started with. So um, I've got Tuesday nights I do my super coach episode. It has rotating guests from the super coach community, a lot of past winners and a lot of regulars that jump on with me, um, which we rotate through. And that hits on a Wednesday afternoon. And the non super coach episode. So on a Thursday, we record a a talk and footy podcast and that normally gets out before the round kicks off so that's just all rugby league talk where we have a talk about all the things in in rugby league as well as look at some past games and legends of the game that have passed us by and stuff like that so uh yeah if you want to get on there spotify amazon itunes soundcloud we're everywhere uh, nrl all-stars podcast go give it a crack ah uh, great stuff and uh roscoe are you and timmy doing your Tuesday night podcast. Yeah, we'll do our TLT on Tuesday night as usual. Um, just go through the bit of trade talk, um, trading trade outs, and also the teams uh, as well. It'll be good to go through some of that, mate, because I've uh, I've got the fun filled afternoon of parent teacher interviews at school on uh, Tuesday, so I'll be busting to get out of there as quick as I can to come home, just so I can uh, check out who's who and. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, we'll lay the pod down on Tuesday night. Yep. All right. Great stuff. Anything extra, Roscoe, you need to add? No, just thanks, Mark, for coming on. Um, and just good luck to those guys on the left. There's eight of us, eight of them left in the Maddie Wilson fundraiser. Um, so congrats to those guys who are left. And um, we may even look at potentially putting up another one um, for the back half of the season at some stage as well. So thank you for everyone who's jumped on board with that one. Hey, am I still in it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I was out first week, so if it makes you feel any better. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, anything extra, Timmy? No, mate. All good. Just keep an eye out this week, guys, for our articles. Um, I will definitely have a fear factor on the uh, the rooster booster. Does your team need a rooster boost? Oh, mate, I can't wait. And I'll have the PPM madness up as usual. Probably going to be looking at a few conundrums this week. We've we've spoken about a few of them, the Dewey situation, uh, what you do there. And there's a lot of people stuck with an AE uh, nightmare in their front row because a lot of teams went very cheap there and looked at cheap options. And uh, I know there's a lot of AE nightmares just sitting there. I think Barnsley just mentioned one with Stefano. He's one, one that you've got to try to, you know, he's not so much of a nightmare, but there's a few others like Pelé and, uh, Moule and uh, yeah, there's a few few nightmares hanging in there. Anyway, everybody, thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to tune in Tuesday night. Go check out Barnsley's of the All Stars podcast as well. Till then, have a great evening. Thank you, Cheers, boys. Cheers. Thanks to be good.